recording um, in two minutes, you can. Um... Okay, so as I have time, because I don't know why I have this, which shouldn't be. Okay. Perfect. I will start the recording now. Uh, participants are still coming in. Just so, a moment. Yes. Because I had to update the agenda this morning. And uh, that was this. Okay, now I'm ready. Please, Anka, tell me when I can start. Uh, I will start the recording now and you can start. Thank you so much. Good morning to everybody. This is a side workshop within the main event of Water Innovation Europe. And uh, it is dealing with uh, uh, systemic value chains uh, and how water uh, can uh, be uh, implied uh, within uh, this uh, new economic and industrial development uh, uh, concepts. Uh, we will speak today about the electric vehicles battery value chain, which is a story of water from raw materials recycling. The water impact of uh, electromobility uh, will be uh, developed considering the various steps within the value chain. But before, let me introduce uh, my hosts. Okay. Uh, which uh, are indeed uh, Tom Varaiken uh, speaking about the systemic value chains and their water implications. There will be myself with a short introduction about the water matrix in electromobility. And then Marco Everts and Eduardo Guerini from the industrial and the consultancy world. Marco Evers uh, will speak about the IPCI European Battery Innovation Initiative and Eduardo Guerini will speak about water cycle in pyro and hydrometallurgies. Um, I would leave the floor to Tom Varaiken for a short introduction about uh, the systemic value chains and their water implication in order to start our workshop. There will be the opportunity at the end of this workshop to speak about, uh, um, you know, the most relevant uh, Eduardo, you are muted. Um, and it's only me or Maria Cristina is. Uh... Uh, only Maria Cristina. I okay. think it's blocked. Oh, yes. Because I, see Tom. I see Tom moving. Yeah, me too. This was my cue. I saw you moving because I'm... I'm, I had bad internet in the past. Yes. So Maria Cristina is uh, out on. <laughs> yes, she will come back for sure. It's her internet for sure. Let's wait her, for her a few seconds there.
Or maybe Tom, you continue. Yes, that's fine. I can start my, my, my introduction and then hopefully afterwards, Maria Christina is back again. Thank you very much. Well, my name is Tom Verrijken. I'm from the Netherlands and a water technologist by profession. I work as a board member on the Dutch Regional Water Authority, um, but I spend uh, also a lot of time on the topic of diffuse water pollution and the prevention of that. I'm uh, quite excited to speak to you uh, a little bit um, about the topic that we currently have, um, because systemic value change are in many aspects, a new type of demand for the water systems in Europe. Um, just yesterday in my water board, we had a broad discussion about new data centers that are supposed to be arriving in our polder area. And obviously they take a lot of water and there are many concerns about the quality of the discharged water and the thermal pollution that they might uh, might create. But as a matter of fact, uh, we, we all need to be convinced of the fact that this is a development that we need to accelerate, that we depend on, uh, such as also the energy, uh, new energy strategies are necessary and our approaches to prevent carbon dioxide uh, from polluting our climate. These are all challenges that we need to very seriously attack uh, as soon as possible. And water has a particular role there. You could see water as the ordering principle to tackle these, pro these, these, system, these uh, problems. Water is not just an utility that is there. The water is just uh, a very valuable resource that if it's not there, we cannot afford ourselves to create sustainable energy or to have data centers or to produce uh, uh, batteries for our electric uh, mobility. So by looking at water as a, an important ordering principle, we can also prevent that in our approach to become more sustainable with, with energy and with our mobility and, and more sustainable in, uh, in many things in the circular economy, we need to prevent that we spoil the water in a way that we can never recover from again. And that, that is an important insight, I think. The moment that our sustainability efforts create a form of diffuse pollution from which we cannot recover, then of course we shoot ourselves in the foot. Um, so in our discussions yesterday evening on ICT and the data center, one of the important outcome were that yes, of course we should allow these developments to go, to come. And of course we should uh, uh, support them very much because in the new approach, they will also enable a more efficient economy and a less, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, a less impacting uh, economy on, on our climate. So they need to be supported. But if we organize ourselves with water at the, as an ordering, ordering principle and make sure that whatever we do is not irreversible in terms of water quality or water temperature, then this could as, we, as well uh, be a chance for us to innovate on our solutions. And specifically for data center, for instance, one innovation would be that you are cooling without water. If uh, an authority would demand that to happen before an ICT center is uh, settling, then you trigger the innovation. You make sure that whatever is there in order to, um, uh, to get the newest solutions in place um, will, be a, will have a very positive effect uh, altogether. The opposite is that if you ignore the aspect of what the quality impacts, then the diffuse pollution that we will get uh, uh, will be a long-term problem that is even bigger than the climate problem that we are facing today. So what I would say in terms of uh, our massive support 
for the development of circular technologies, energy technologies that all help us to have a lesser impact on, uh, on climate change or even a, a positive impact on the recovery from climate change. We should take water as an ordering principle, making sure that we do not have any, uh, let's say, uh, irrevocable effects and make this a driver for innovation in your sector, in this new sector. And by approaching it in this way, I think we can benefit from both, from the economic effects of the, of the, the let's say, the, the systemic value change that are now developing, and at the same time, taking care of our water quality in the proper way, so that also our children will benefit from sufficient water with a proper quality. Well, then I would like to give you, as the start of this interesting webinar, uh, very quickly, we should move forward, I think, to the, to the content of uh, uh, how these systemic value chains work. But please take in mind that the water implications are really there and should be covered before we, uh, we move ahead. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that Maria Christina meanwhile has been able to join us again. Yes, Don, I'm here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for this interruption. I think that we can go ahead and Anka can share my presentation. Uh, thank you for the valuable content. Actually, systemic value chains are uh, a great opportunity and challenge for the sustainable economy development in the early future and for the future generations. So, Anka, if you can uh, share the presentation, I can go through it before. Yes, one second, please. Yes. Before giving the stage to do you see it? Great. Perfect. Let me make it full screen. Done. Okay. Yeah. And let's go to the first slide, which is about the water impact. Uh, no, the previous one. Oh, sorry. Okay. The water impact of electromobility. Actually, um, what I'm going to give you are some uh, pillars about uh, what we are discussing about today. First of all, uh, when we speak about electric vehicle uh, batteries, we speak also about the necessity to have energy storage at high level in order to be able to feed all these uh, uh, batteries uh, working uh, tools. Uh, and this will be a challenge for water availability for, uh, for instance, for agriculture. If we think about irrigations and if we think about the hydropower, which is now the main storage system for energy, that will be an issue we should think about. And we will see in the next slide. Secondly, when we speak about, no, again, uh, the same slide. When we speak about electric vehicle batteries, of course, uh, we speak about a high level of power and uh, for Providing this, uh, we need uh, we need uh, to uh, develop electrolytes, uh, which are based on uh, raw materials uh, of uh, a specific inside value. So for, instance, for instance, lithium, it can be cobalt, it can be manganese, and all these materials are a planet issue not only for uh, the limited amount of these materials on the planet, but also because of the extraction of these materials require a huge quantity of water. And third, when we speak about recycling of uh, electric vehicle batteries, again, there is a challenge for water protection because recycling methodologies are the uh, often based on uh, water. We need water to perform these recycling processes. And last but not least, uh, I would like to 
uh, drive your attention towards a very positive effect of electromobility, which is related, for instance, to waterborne transports. We are not thinking only about uh, electric vehicle mobilities related to cars and city cars and citizens' move movements within the urban context. We are also speaking about uh, hybrid ships uh, and uh, we are uh, speaking about uh, transport of materials from one side to the other side of the planet. We are speaking about waterborne transport, which will be hybrid and will be, uh, let's say, uh, will be based uh, on uh, batteries as well. And this will be a huge gain for the ocean's health because uh, we will avoid uh, the pollution of the ocean uh, by, for instance, uh, uh, sulfur-based uh, oxides uh, and uh, other polluting agents, which are now an issue for the, the ocean's health. If we go to the next slide, Please, Anka. The energy storage and water for agriculture. Again, as I said before, very quickly, the climate mitigation calls for an increase in renewable energy, while hydro hydrological impacts of climate change, population and economic growth, and associated dietary change increase the need for irrigated food production in many regions around the world. We all know that in summer, especially in the south of Europe, for instance, but in many other countries around the planet, we have the problem of lack of water for irrigation, irrigative purposes due to the fact that water has to be digged in order to provide a suitable energy storage for the industrial context and to provide energy to all of us and electricity. So we all need to have different energy storage systems and the electric vehicle batteries and the new batteries solutions are towards this challenge. The storage for renewable energy will be actually a major driver of battery demand. By 2050, the share of electricity in final energy demand will at least double to 53%, and therefore the whole range of energy storage technologies will be required, including pumped hydro, batteries, and chemical storage, that is, uh, for instance, hydrogen. So again, we need to diversify the energy storage systems in order to save water for the other purposes. And here we have a major point related to irrigation to provide crops and food for the citizens, for the social community. By 2050, batteries are expected to play a far more significant role than pumped hydro storage technology. And this is good for the water protection. And now, as I said before, the main storage technology that is hydropower actually is accounting for over 90% of the energy storage capacity in the European Union. And uh, let's go ahead with the next slide. If we go to materials extraction increase and water treatment, well, uh, very quickly I can say that raw materials extraction and processing needs and uh, and uh, uh, cause, I would say, emissions, uh, not only to air and land, but also to water. As I, I said before, especially regarding mining, uh, we know that there are problems uh, in, uh, uh, of pollution of the urban water wells uh, due, to, due to the infiltration of uh, pollutants from the mining activities. Think about the problems we have in, in uh, north of the USA and also in Canada, but this is usual all, this is, uh, usual all around the planet. Raw materials extraction feed the electric vehicle battery value chain will be an issue for water protection. If we go to the next slide, Again, this is a nice graph which is about the raw materials scoreboard that was developed by the JRC for 2021 up to 2050. And it shows how the 
raw material extraction as well as basic manufacturing uh, and also the final products and distribution and consumption uh, and uh, end of life uh, and so recycling are uh, uh, have uh, strong implications with what as Tom said at the beginning of this conference. And uh, we also see from the scoreboard how this issue is a social issue. So when we speak about systemic value chains, actually we are speaking about uh, social implications of uh, new technologies, innovations uh, in uh, our human community. And if we go to the next slide again, here we see the battery chemistry types of material extractions increase. We see that for primary batteries as well as for rechargeable batteries in the different technologies, we have the need for the extraction of many different elements such as silver, zinc, cadmium, we have manganese, we have lithium, as I said before, but we have also uh, manganese, for instance, which is, uh, again, and this is especially for the energy storage devices. So, again, the battery chemistry types show us the way to look at in order to think about innovative extraction processes taking care of water protection. And if we go to the next slide, we see how uh, this is, uh, uh, we see which is the impact uh, in terms of water consumption nowadays uh, uh, for the field of uh, raw material extraction. And so I'm speaking about mining mainly. We see this study from uh, Australia. Uh, how in a constrained climate scenario, the water consumption, for instance, of the Australian rare earth industry in 2050, will represent more than two thirds, that is 70% of water abstractions of all industrial sectors. That means that actually, uh, when we consider the new value chain, uh, we have always to think about the fact that in systemic value chains, whatever we produce within a value chain can impact a wider uh, circular uh, context. And therefore, any solution we provide needs a, a higher vision, a, um, an amplitude of the problem, uh, which is different from the one we were used uh, till now. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we go to recycling, and this is again a challenge inter for water protection. We will see with uh, Eduardo which are the challenges uh, in uh, relation to uh, recycling for electric vehicle batteries. What we can say is that recycling is uh, very important in the systemic value chain, not only uh, to scale up the needed volumes. We have said before that uh, the natural resources are limited uh, and considering the development which is expected from uh, uh, the electromobility, most probably there will be, let's say, commercial wars in order to get uh, the uh, supply of these uh, necessary uh, raw materials. But uh, recycling is also an issue to reduce water consumption and uh, to generate a water systemic value chain aiming at water reuse. So whatever we develop in order to recycle the raw materials and to provide second life batteries and new batteries generated with the recycled secondary raw materials, we have also to uh, develop technologies which make it possible to reuse water out of these processes. And if we go to the next slide, I, okay, we go to a nice challenge I would like to put to your attention that is the one related to the waterborne transports challenge, the ocean's water health. Definitely the electromobility with its needs, especially related to raw materials and uh, uh, also uh, complex materials to be developed along the value chain, uh, uh, actually generating a challenge. 
which uh, push all of us uh, thinking about new methodologies, new technologies, uh, and a new way of thinking processes. But on the other side, the electromobility is a challenge we have to take indeed in order to reduce the pollution, not only of the air, but also of the, wa of, uh, the water. If we think about that, uh, the different transport modes, road, waterborne and airborne, represent together around 20-50% of total CO2 emissions in the European Union, and that the transport demand con is continuing to grow, and the sector remains the only one which has not been able to reduce its CO2 emissions. And this is because even if, uh, let's say, uh, we have decreased uh, um, uh, the uh, CO2 emission by the different transportation modes. We have an increased transportation need around the planet due also to the increase of the population and uh, of the human needs. We definitely need to uh, develop uh, new transportation technologies in order to reduce the environmental impact. And there are studies about developing new batteries, which are able to provide a support to the hybrid engine of the ships in order to be able to ship in the material with a lower impact on the environment. Then, if we go to the water just to give you a number which is interesting, uh, we see that uh, evaluations of the cost of the new electric, uh, let's say, um, electric vehicle batteries approach for the waterborne transport is very high now, but you see from the slide that uh, from uh, a cost of 150 euros per kilowatt per hour, of energy in 2020. Uh, with the, the developing technologies in this moment, uh, we are supposed to decrease the cost from 150 to 75, which is actually the 50% less than the actual cost. And this is good because this means that as soon as the technologies will be standardized, validated, and will be scaled up at uh, let's say global level, we will have, as I said in the previous slide, a new option for the easy transport, waterborne transport with less environmental impact. So this was just an introduction presentation, just to give you a few seats to think about and few numbers to uh, stimulate uh, your attention towards uh, the implications of electric electromobility and uh, the related technologies uh, uh, on uh, the water. And uh, I thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, now, if uh, 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 we can close this uh, presentation, we can go to Marco Everts presenting you the IPCI financial tool, as well as the Electric Vehicle Battery European Initiative, which is an interesting example about new supporting instruments by the European Commission together with the member states. Please, Marco, take the stage and develop your interesting presentation for the audience. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria, for this very kind introduction. Also, thanks for inviting me to, to present the, the IPSA, uh, IPSA initiative here in this very interesting field of, of uh, yeah, water technology, which is, of course, uh, an interesting field for, um, for, for the battery um, itself. Um, so, yeah, so um, I'm working at uh, VDI, VDE Innovation and Technik, uh, GmbH, um, and we are supporting the Federal German Ministry for Economic Affairs uh, and Energy uh, in Germany for um, implementing the uh, IPSE, uh, IPSE initiatives, both on the, um, on the financial aspect. So we are the project management agency um, for the ministry, as well as on the yeah, more helping um, 
ecosystem friendly way because we are also the accompanying research um, of this battery initiative by the by the German authorities. So we are also supporting the um, German players, of course, but as well the the European players as well. And uh, Anke, if you could uh, show show the next next slide. So now I, I want to show um, how we we um, support the battery industry and and maximize the impact of the battery IPCI, so the two battery ICPIs, in implementing a new um, battery ecosystem in Europe, as well as yeah, enhancing sustainable um, yeah, batteries in, in Europe as well. Um, next slide, please. So how we do that? Um, those are three ways we are doing that. It's either by knowledge transfer, I will go into detail um, to that, uh, the community building so for example um yeah enhancing the ecosystem by by different studies and also the stakeholder um dialogue and um, most particularly with the german companies but also at a later stage with other european companies as well um next slide please um so how are we doing this this knowledge transfer this is pretty easy we we want to share information like today we also uh, offer publications and um, we are enabling discussions with different shareholders along along the whole, whole battery value chain and we are organizing events. Um, next slide. So now let me go into some, some details and facts about this IPSE. So there were two battery IPCIs uh, on the way. The first one was the IPSE on batteries approved by the European Commission um, in December 2019. And the second one, which uh, Maria already already mentioned, is the um, IPSA Hubert in the European Battery Innovation, which was which was notified in uh, January 2021. Um, you can see the landscape on the right side. So it's a pretty impressive landscape. We have over 15 companies in, in the both um, IPCIs working together to to enhance the battery ecosystem. Um, in 12 member states, we have more than 50 participating companies, as I said, with more than 150 external partners um, collaborating with those, um, those companies and around 300 co collaborations within those 50 companies along the whole battery value chain. So it's a huge integrated project. And I mean, just, just by the pure size of it, it's pretty immense and it will help to build up the ecosystem. Um, talking about money now, so we have up to 6.1 billion um, euros in state aid, which would unlock additionally 14 billion euros in private investment. So we're talking about a total investment of around 20 billion euros just for the ecosystem of a battery. Um, yeah, as, as said, the, the value chain, chain is well distributed. We're starting with materials, battery cells, modules and system, and of course the recycling, but I will go, uh, dive uh, dive into detail in the next slides. Um, moreover, we create more than 18,000 new jobs uh, with this in initiative, with those two battery IPCIs, and we potentially tra train up to 800 workers to match the workforce requirements in terms of um, yeah, transition in, in different um, sectors. So now the next slide, please. Um, yeah, as I said, so come on, uh, let's dive into the, the IPSA value chain, just um, sh showing you the Hubert in value chain. The IPSA on battery chain is pretty similar. Um, so we have basically four work streams. Um, we are talking about material extraction, material production, and as Maria already said, material ex extraction is a key issue right now. So if you're thinking about lithium extraction and lithium raw mining, um, there are two potential ways. You have either the ores or either you enhance, uh, you, you get lithium out, out of huge salt lakes, for instance, in, in South America. So this is, of course, of course a big issue for, for water supply, and especially in, in those regions as we don't have this much water supply. So I guess we have a, a good um, spillover effect with, um, with you guys today. And the second um, work stream is the cell manufacturing. Of course, we have we have to build the cells in, in Europe somehow, and I guess we, we're doing it quite good now. Um, then the next thing is um, the module um, and system assembly, as well as the product implementations. And we're not talking talking about just um, electric vehicles, unless it's, unless it's just depicted here, but we're also talking about energy storage systems. 
We're talking about air bonds and of course, waterborne trans transportations. And um, we have some partners that are just focusing on waterborne transportations with lithium ion batteries. And um, I guess this is also interesting. And of course, um, the recycling of batteries. And just, we want to ensure a full recycling of the battery, either in terms of second life application. So after the, the usage in, in an electric vehicle, you can use the battery in, in an electric energy storage, for instance, but also the, the full um, recycling of materials up to um, yeah 100% of the whole battery materials, even if it's um, re um, really, really difficult. Um, yeah, I've just depicted here two really, I guess, important objectives of our um, UBIT in project. So the first one is to develop innovative and sustainable battery materials, cells and systems for automotive and other key applications, as I just mentioned, water and air airborne transportation as well, to unlock the full technological potential of the battery value chain in Europe. I guess, especially the word sustainable is here a very important, uh, important aspect because we striving for the most sustainable batteries coming out of Europe, as mentioned by, by Maro Sefkovic and uh, Peter Alt Altmaier and um, Bruno Le Maire, I think in 2017. And I think the second important objective is ensure consequent battery recycling and thus a circular material flow. So we don't have to extract that many materials and we can recycle them and maintain high environmental and social standards as well. Um, yeah, on the, on the bottom left corner, you can just see how the, the companies are distributed over the, over the whole work streams or over the whole, yeah, just say the, the main, the main um, things we are doing. Um, it's quite evenly distributed. Um, as you can see a bit more in the module and system assembly uh, and the recycling is, is with 23 companies pretty pretty well um, organized here as well. Um, next slide, please. So I just talked about a lot about two IPSE. So just, just cut to the chase. Uh, IPSE 1, the IPSE on batteries is coordinated by the French authorities, by the French government for um, yeah, the French government. And we as VDI, VDET are managing the, the funded participations of five German companies. In, in total, the IPSE on batteries um, has a company um, count of 16 companies working from seven, seven member states of the European Union. The second IPCI is the IPCI UBIT, uh, UBIT but in which I just showed you, um, this is coordinated by the German government and we as a VDI, VDET are coordinating the whole European effort and the European affairs and dra drafted, for instance, the notification documents for, for this whole, docu uh, for this whole um, yeah, project. Um, in total, we have 11 German companies participating in that. We are also managing the funding participation, of course, here, but we, we also have, um, in total, 42 companies from 12 member states of the European Union. So it's much larger in size in terms of the companies, uh, participating companies and participating member states, which is quite interesting. And um, so what, what can we do with those two IPSAs? As I just said, we want to enhance the ecosystem. We want to yeah, get new jobs. And we also want to have, have networking activities. So combined conferences, um, we want to share our, our knowledge. We want to, uh, yeah, gain knowledge and share this and doing, doing spillover events um, and share the innovativeness of the new uh, lithium ion battery, for, for instance. And as I said, enhancing the European battery ecosystem, which, which is the key aspects. And we as an accompanying research of this project um, are supporting the German funded project in, in the first place, but also um, supporting the European um, companies at a later stage, as soon as both IPCIs are really set up in terms of a governance structure. So this is what we are doing in, in the next slide. In the next slide, I will show you how we're doing that. So first of all, um, we prepared already some publications. Um, I guess one important publication, which is also interesting for you, is probably the battery cell manufacturing ecosystem in Europe. Um, you can just download it by scanning the, the QR code. Um, otherwise, I I'm, I'm happy to, to provide, provide you with the link um, afterwards, just, just contact me. 
So this is one we already published. Another one is a short information about gender equality and diversity, which are of course key, key factors for this emerging um, yeah, new ecosystem and new um, yeah, production scape. And what is else going to happen is, I guess, not, another interesting um, publication for you guys is the sustainable battery production. This publish will be hopefully published in June in the next, hopefully in the next one to two weeks. Uh, I can't say, uh, say about, about the exact, uh, exact date, but if you join our LinkedIn group or join our newsletter, um, you will receive um, the link towards the, this document. And so this is going to happen. And also what is, is interesting, the, the battery cell market, we are working on a, on a publication once a year, a short information publication about the market. How's, how's the mar market going? What are the market forecasts for Europe and worldwide? Um, next slide, please. So um, so further way, further way to, to, to acknowledge this um, yeah, knowledge transfer is that we are um, enabling discussions um, with the battery community and also other communities as well. And therefore we, we invited the uh, live talks. Uh, we have one key question, two battery experts or two experts in their respective fields. And currently we have more, more than 200 participants to, to each of these events. This will all happen the last Thursday of the month and will take up to 45 minutes. Um, pretty intensive discussions, pretty interesting. The next one is in, in the next week, uh, which will be dealing with, with a battery passport. Um, so talking about ecological and social standards of a, of a battery passport, so maybe you want to join, um, happy if, if you do so. Um, so this is something we are doing and uh, preparing also the next talks. And if you have any, I, ideas just come up to us we are we are happy to to uh, include your idea uh, your ideas into our live talks um next slide please okay yeah some some events you you may may heard about is the european conference on batteries uh, which was held last year in november with high level speakers um up to 55 speakers from the ipse but, but also outside 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 of the ipse and um, we invited speakers from Australia, China, Japan, uh, Japan and also the, U uh, uh, U the US. It was a 100% virtual event, quite interesting for me. So first, first, I, first I'm a, a virtual event with, with over uh, 3,000 participants. So quite a quite interesting uh, event. What also is interesting is that we prepared a virtual table with information about the battery, so the battery ecosystem, the battery itself, and also the IPCIs. So it, if you're interested in, in this technique and this, uh, yeah, this instrument of an IPCI, just, just join the, the QR code and browse through our table. It's quite interesting. It's in German and in English available. So just if, if you want to have some fun with the battery, just do so and uh, yeah, click, uh, click the link or scan the QR code. Um, next slide, please, Anka. Yes, community building. Um, this is something I already said, the ecosystem um, study. Um, so, so how are we doing that? We um, are participating in networks. We are having a social media account, a LinkedIn group. Uh, we are also doing some data analytics and of course, matchmaking events, which was especially um, held doing doing the um, yeah pre preparation of the UBIT in IPCI. Um, next slide, please. So this is a pretty pretty immense um, um, yeah slide. Uh, this is this is our ecosystem tool that we are de de uh, developing currently. We have a database of three thousand one hundred actors, um, both industry associations and RTLs. So if you if you want to have access to it, um, maybe at a later stage, I think we're still in, in the beta phase of that. Um, but as soon as we as we reach, uh, as, as we done with the beta phase, we will host this online and then you can just slide and share and, and look into which connection and which company is connected by, by, by which links 
then which association is also inter interconnected with with some companies so this is this is a quite interesting tool um but as, as said it's just a better it's just in a better better phase right now but we are happy to to share this as soon as this will better phase is finished um next slide please yeah as said um battery networks they are a large number of battery networks of course and um, i guess even more for for water networks um we have um, the global networks the global battery alliance which we are also participating in and coordinating one work group there and um, there are several european um, initiatives and um, you, you probably heard of, uh, a lot of a lot about them so batteries europe the european battery alliance um eurobot recharge etc and so on so this is a huge number and we try to collaborate with those networks as well to enhance the the ipci um, in those networks and just yeah multiply the the result of, of an ipci together with all the battery networks that are currently established and are, and are already established in europe globally and uh, yeah in germany as well so if you if you have an, another network we should participate in or that, that you think that is interesting for us please come come to us and uh, we think about that um yes next slide um please uh, as as already said we do have some social media activities because without social media i can't survive anymore um we have a LinkedIn group that's pretty impressive. Wow, we have more than 1,660 professionals in this group. And there we will, will we post the news about the battery IPCIs. We will update the um, accompanying research activities, for instance, the upcoming um, sustainability study, which will be soon published. And there, there is, of course, an opportunity to meet and discuss. And we will also um, yeah, announce our live talks in, in this LinkedIn group. So if you'd like to join, please scan the QR code. Happy to interact with, with you um, on, on that basis. Um, yeah, next slide. And then you can skip skip this slide. Um, and please, Anka. Um, so the last thing is the stakeholder, stakeholder dialogue. Um, so we, we're trying to yeah to en to enable um, the stakeholder dialogue between the, uh, the the regulator and the companies and also us as an uh, accompanying research we we're trying to have uh, to implement workshops and working groups in in the first first phase as mentioned just for the german companies but in the second phase potentially also for other companies from europe maybe maybe um, also globally and you can see there, those are our um, 16 companies that are participating in, in both um, battery IPCIs. Um, in case you want to know all participating companies, you have to go to the to European Commission site. It's publicly available uh, information there. And yeah, currently work groups we are enabling are industry 4.0 standards and um, norms and standards as well. And um, recycling and resources is another working group um, we are currently hosting at ourselves sustainability, as mentioned, the sustainability study is soon to be published. And of course, qualification and diversity, because we need to have qualified personnel who can, can operate, um, for instance, a battery cell manufacturer or a battery cell manufacturing plant, or even up to a recycling and the materials extractor. So qualification. Is, is a key issue, of course. Yes, and this comes to my last two slides. So um, I guess I just showed you a lot of information about what we are offering. And this is what we are offering to support the, the battery industry via knowledge transfer, community building, anti stakeholder dialogue. And with that, I'm, I'm at the end of my talk. If you want to keep in touch and benefit from our activities, um, if you can show the next slide, Anka, please um, just join our LinkedIn group as said, or join our battery PCI newsletter. This will be, I guess, forwarded once a month. Um, so if you want to be updated about batteries, please feel free to join this newsletter. And in case you have any questions, do not hesitate um, to contact me afterwards. 
I'm happy to to help and happy to yeah discuss further further initiatives. And if you have any questions about the IPSE, I guess we still have the panelist questions afterwards. And yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Marco, for the, this interesting presentation. Uh, definitely, I strongly believe uh, in uh, the water implications of uh, this uh, new uh, sustainable electric vehicle battery uh, value chain. Indeed, there will be opportunities for the interactions with the Water European platform. I strongly believe in it, uh, as uh, we, we, we could show uh, through these presentations. And uh, in addition, I would say that I strongly appreciate uh, the wideness uh, of the industrial scenario uh, from any level of the battery value chain, which is involved in the IPCI initiative, which shows that actually the European companies are all towards uh, the uh, fulfillment of uh, the um, new European industrial strategy, which as it is foreseen uh, both in the uh, Green New Deal uh, as well as in uh, the uh, recovery plan of all the countries around Europe. Uh, we need as Europe uh, to keep the leadership in the technology and this is really a great opportunity. I now I would like to leave the stage to Eduardo Guerini, which is the technical director of uh, NG Tech Technologies SPA, one of the partners of the IPCI. This will be a very technical, interesting presentation about the water implications in the recycling of the batteries. So I leave you the stage, not to uh, waste time. Please, Eduardo, go ahead. Okay. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thanks, uh, Maria. Um, well, I start my presentation. I hope that you can hear me and you can, you can see the presentation. Um, so the, what I would like to talk about now is the water cycle and environment and hydrometallurgies. This is a quite uh, wide uh, talking, so I have to stay inside the 20 minutes. I will try to give a few ideas, a few way of thinking uh, from, this, from the industrial point of view. Uh, we as Hangitech, uh, we are one of the industries inside the IPCI too, and we are there for the lithium recycling. But now um, I'm a chemist. So uh, the most important thing for chemistry, for chemists is the reaction. So what happens to the product that you want? So up to now and in the last years uh, was really uh, a true thing. Uh, all the people were thinking about the lithium, about the cobalt, about the manganese and so on. But uh, the water normally plays a second role in a chemical plant. It's simply the way you want to move your, the things that you need around the plant if you are uh, trying to make a product. But as a chemist, I'm not a um, water cycle assessment uh, a scientist, so please forgive me if I say something a little bit wrong from the water point of view. Anyway, water footprint. Uh, I have uh, the, the first slide is uh, the hidden waters and we start with uh, uh, the definitions. If we don't know what we are talking about, it's particularly difficult to, to understand what we say. So the first definitions that I would like to uh, give to you are the blue water, the green water, and the green water. The blue water is uh, simply the water that you have in the ground and on the surface. So it means lakes and rivers. So an industry that uses lakes and rivers to make the process, they use the blue water. If they throw water from the process to the uh, environment without any chemical change, then you increase the blue water of your process. Then there's the green water, and that comes mostly from the water moisture. This means uh, uh, like rain, for example. So you, if you produce only vapor, then you produce green water. Instead, the gray water is a particular kind of uh, water, and it's used is the water that is used for dilution of the pollutants. And it's a practical uh, and it's a common way of thinking about pollution in the uh, in the history of the chemical plants and so on. If you have a concentration too high, you put inside a lot of fresh water, and then you go below the limits of the low, and that's all. 
you're you're okay with this. Now it's no more possible because even the gray water is quantified for the water footprint of whatever you want to measure the water footprint. So the first statement that I would like to give you is that if we produce a product with a smaller gray water footprint, then we have put less pressure on the freshwater resource and contributed less to water quality degradation. This means that the first way of thinking about a plant is try to minimize the gray water production. Uh, this means throw less pollutants inside the environment. Uh, so the first three words that are not more normally used in this field are the three R rule. This means reduce, reuse, and recycle. As uh, all the people here in the in this meeting already said many times, uh, reusing and recycling is the key factor for uh, decrease the water footprint of whatever we want to see. Uh, all these three words they act differently on the on the three kinds of water that I presented you. So uh, recycling means that you will never throw water in the environment, so you will never produce the gray water. So that's why recycling is so important. And how would you modify the uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle uh, policy? Uh, you can modify the process that you already have and optimize it. And this is the common way up to now. You can crystallize your pollutants. This means take away your solids. And so you have fresh water and you can throw it inside the rivers. Or instead, you can destroy, uh, distract, uh, destroy the uh, organic pollutants and it can be made only with organics. Uh, and the last one is the most important one, I think is the one that uh, has inside all the innovation that, that Europe can give and is the change of the process. When you have a process that is not more able to, optim to be optimized, then maybe it's time to uh, discuss a different process that can, make your pro that can make your product in a different way. And that's what I would like to talk about in my presentation. Uh, but before talking about uh, our processes in, uh, in NGTech, uh, uh, there is a problem, the problem of quantification. I have read a lot of literature to present, to prepare the presentation. And uh, so many times in these papers there's written, oh, we are not able to uh, assess the data of what the industry takes out from the process and throw it into the, exo in the ecosphere. So normally you have the ecosphere where the water is, and then you have the technosphere. This means the place where all the processes happen and where you produce your product. You have a withdrawal of water from one sphere to the other, and then the ecosphere is released water to the, um, the, to the environment. But normally the, the real problem of quantification is in the release. Uh, many times it's even not possible to quantify this quantity. So normally uh, a lot of papers, they simply say this is the withdrawal of the water and they don't know the release. So another definition that it is a problem again for the quantification of the footprint. This means that the water footprint of a final product is the summation of the water footprint of each step or process or product that you are you use to produce that product. This means that you have a direct footprint of your product. This means the real water that you use inside your process and you have an indirect uh, quantity of a uh, water footprint that comes from all the things that you have and that you use and that you buy uh, when you make a product. So when you buy something for your, for your process, you buy even the footprint of that material. So you sum them too, and you have the water footprint of your process or of your product. So if you sell the product that you sell, then you sell the water footprint of this product and this can become an indirect water footprint for the other processes that, that may come. This is a big uh, mess of uh, continuing thinking about uh, how water uh, um, can change the water footprint of the final product. And this uh, especially is true for the batteries, because if you, I will not talk about all the batteries in the world and all the chemicals in the world, because it would take too much time. But as an example, there's the zinc manganese, for example, that has these kind of elements. There are many others, but these are the, the most important ones inside the zinc manganese. Then the nickel cadmium, it has inside many chemicals too. The, the lead acid battery, lead acid battery is very simple as a, as a battery. It is plastics, lead in different ways, but it's always lead. And then you have sulfuric acid. So, it, so this is quite a stupid battery from the chemical point of view. Uh, 
Uh, if you take a look instead of uh, about lithium, lithium is quite a big mess. There are many chemicals, many compounds, many ways to assemble it. So it's a big quantity of uh, different materials inside the same battery. Uh, and this is a problem, even for the water footprint uh, uh, quantification. If we uh, simply say uh, an array of all the elements, uh, main elements inside batteries, uh, you see that are, that these are a quite a lot of elements. And there are many others, but these are only the main ones. And if you want to calculate the water footprint of your process, managing the lead, managing the, the lithium batteries, then you must understand the water footprint of each of these elements. So by the true slide that, that I said before, uh, it's practically impossible <laughs> up to now. So the numbers in literature, many times that they don't agree with each other only for these simple reasons. Um, I, the other problem is that the primary and secondary uh, sources. This means the primary is the minery. You take out the uh, the salts of uh, of your element from the earth and you modify them to obtain the metal. And the secondary is the recycling. So data for recycling. Uh, one of the most common uh, phrases that I have seen in literature is that the environmental water footprint of recycled minerals is much smaller than that of minerals directly extracted from the subsoil. This is obvious from a chemical point of view, because maybe we know all the processes that are behind a simple method. But from the numbers point of view, uh, we can say that, for example, rare earths, this means all the elements that are used for the um, electric, for all our electrical power, electrical systems that we use every day, we see that if we take one, the quantity of water that is used for this recycling, these rare elements, uh, the production from the uh, primary, so from the minery, is five times more. So it's a big quantity of, uh, of water used in the, in the primary in respect to the secondary. The cobalt is even worse, 20 times more water for the primary cobalt instead of the secondary. That's why cobalt is so important to be recycled and to be obtained from the uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, the magnesium is uh, more or less uh, not so much different. Uh, but in any way, recycling is always better than taking it right directly from the environment. Zinc is 1 to 15, and this is important for the slides that we talk about in the, in the next uh, few minutes. And uh, we, if, for example, we take a, a particular kind of recycling material. This means the fly ash. And the fly ash is a, a dust that is produced in many kinds of industrial processes. If you take out these kind of elements like copper, magnesium, and zinc, then the recovering the water footprint for the recovering of these elements from the fly ash is practically negligible. This means that these kind of elements are practically easy to take out, and so you can you are able to optimize the water footprint for these recycling processes. Um, Another thing that is very important uh, that comes from the three R rules uh, is that if you want to reuse a material, for example, a glass bottle uh, of water, uh, you can take it and throw it again into the oven to melt it and build another bottle, or you can fill it again with water and use it again. So it's quite easy to understand that uh, if you reuse a material, then the, the water footprint is divided by the number of times uh, that you use the, this material. That's why reusing is very important even for the lithium batteries and everyone is trying to make the reuse before trying to recycle it. Let's take an example. It's not for lithium batteries, but it's from zinc batteries and, and uh, it's a very important element in the industrial, in the industrial environment is the zinc. Uh, normally the zinc, primary zinc comes from the sulfide, zinc sulfide is polarite, then you have a process and this process produces metal. But we are behind this simple row. There are a lot of steps that are, these are the problem for from many points of view. So the first step is the mining and the mining has sub steps inside like blasting, drilling, holding, and so on. Then there's the flotation that uses chemicals to obtain this flotation. You have filtering and when you filter, you have to wash what you filter and you, then you use fresh water for making this. Then the roasting. Roasting is made at high, very high temperatures and you produce a sulfuric acid. To produce your sulfuric acid, you need water. The smelting is made at high temperatures. You use carbon 
then you produce carbon dioxide. Then refining, depending on how much refined you want the metal. So the purest metal uses a lot of refining and refining costs, even not only in terms of money, but even in terms of a footprint for the carbon footprint and water footprint and all the footprints that you want to imagine. So the purest metal uses the more of footprint of whatever. All these steps, uh, they use water. I have, say, I have uh, pictured here only the blue water, but uh, all the waters are implied here. And for example, for the, the primal production of, of zinc, you can you use a lot of uh, rain, so use a lot of uh, uh, green water, a lot of blue water. If they, you have lakes and many industries have their private lakes and rivers, and you produce a lot of uh, uh, gray water. So uh, up to now, and now things are changing, but depending on which country you, you think about, then uh, the policy up to a few years ago was dilution is the solution to pollution. So you have a pollutant, you put a lot of water and you forget it. Now as things are changing quite a lot, especially in Europe and in USA, but in many other countries like in a few countries where I've been the last two, two three years, things are still the same. Uh, gray water is never counted. And an example, for example, is the Gulf River. You can take a look at this kind of river. Uh, from the numbers point of view, the quantity of footprint, uh, water footprint for the production of a special grade, special high grade of zinc, so the highest grade of the zinc is about 8,000 liters of water for one kilo of zinc coming from the primary. So it's a quite a lot of uh, water, and this is practically the quantity of water for all the elements, if you take in, into account the water footprint. The hidden blue water, so why so much water? When you make the process and you go to the technosphere and you modify whatever you want, the mineral, the, the recycled materials or, or whatever, you have your reactants. So as I said, the process takes the footprint of whatever you use in your plant. So we, for the zinc production, use the carbon. So product, carbon is produced by a lot of water. So even producing CO2, but you even use water. Then there's the fuel. Producing fuel needs fuel and water. Uh, sulfuric acid is produced and sulfuric acid is not pure. So you have to put inside water to commercialize it. Uh, the lead is used inside the plant for many reasons, but lead has it for the food, water footprint. Machinery, so each piece of iron, each piece of whatever you have inside that you have to change, that you have to buy, has the water footprint. The manpower too, each, each person has a water footprint. For example, the, each European person uses as a water footprint of practically 6,000 uh, liters of water each day, each person. So, and the last one, but not the least from, from the quantity point of view is the electricity. The more electricity, the more water you, the water footprint you use. It's because uh, uh, if energy is, uh, is used to produce water, the water and energy are used to produce energy. So uh, wasted energy means a waste of water, and the same is the, is the opposite. Wasted water means waste of energy. This is the same, and we can make the same uh, examples with the same sulfides uh, used normally in all the, around the world to produce all these kind of elements. So uh, the water footprint changes dramatically. Uh, the blue water, this means only the water taken from the industry to produce uh, uh, a product changes depending on the uh, feeding material that you use at the beginning of your process. For example, the blue water used for the uh, copper sulfide, for, uh, for the copper from the copper sulfide is 96 liters per kilogram. And the one from copper oxide, if you don't have the uh, transformation of sulfide to oxide, then the quantity of water is practically half. But normally the minerals that are normally found in the uh, environment are the sulfides. For the aluminum is 35.9. But if we take a, little, a deeper look inside this number, we see that 97.8% of, of, uh, of this number is uh, coming from the electricity used for the aluminum. We already know as chemists that the aluminum production is a quite uh, electrical energy uh, consumption uh, process. 
but 97.8 is the impact on the water footprint for the electricity use. So depending on which electricity you use. Uh, the Engitech approach, this means our uh, company uh, for the zinc, for example, uh, and this is an example that is uh, that can explain the philosophy of our uh, industry is named Edinex process. Our process practic practically takes waste of containing zinc and transforms them into zinc metal. We try to apply the three R rules at, from the beginning. So uh, we try to optimize the system, make recycling, not only of the zinc, but even of the water inside the, the process. So we take a waste that normally is left around without any modification. <coughs> There are many dumps of this kind of, a, of a products around the world and never treated. So we take, for example, the electric arc furnace, the crude zinc oxide, zinc carbonate or zinc sulfate, and we move and we transform them to zinc metal. And depending on which kind of zinc we produce, of course, we modify the water footprint of the system. With the special high grade, as I already said, we, we use a lot, of, uh, a lot more uh, blue water, instead of producing the prime western that is the lowest, the lowest quality of zinc. So a choice of the, which kind of zinc you want uh, chooses even the, the footprint that you will have on your, on your plant, not only the costs. Uh, we move from the pyrometallurgy, the normal way we uh, produce zinc nowadays that uses furnaces, uses smelting, so produces CO2, and needs a lot of purification that we saw they were made at high temperatures. So you need a lot of energy to stay at that temperature. We move to hydrometallurgy. And this is a choice for changing the process. So the last choice for the footprint of CO2 and water and so on. So we work at room temperature, so we have to use less energy. We have water recycling inside our process. So we don't leave water uh, to go outside, liquid water. So we adopt the policy of zero liquid discharge. By our process, then we use a few quantity of blue water, depending on which kind of zinc you want, and we produce the uh, green water, simply because the water in excess in our plants, it all becomes vapor and it comes out as vapor. So we move from thermal reduction with carbon. It's a, a way of treating the, uh, the salts to produce the zinc, metal zinc. You need to make reduction, you can make with carbon. Uh, now, uh, in the few months, I think, uh, there's the hypothesis for hydrogen, and this is another dis discussion, but uh, there's carbon, uh, and now we move to, to the electrochemistry. So instead of using carbon, we use electricity for the production of zinc. And so, because we use uh, electrochemistry, we have selectivity on uh, the zinc. We reduce the quantity of energy because we work at room temperature and we can modify practically the energies of the process. So, uh, I said that we have no gray water production. We use blue water and we produce green water. Uh, in direct water footprint, I still don't know because I'm a chemist, I'm not a uh, water cycle assessment uh, scientist. So uh, this kind of evaluation will be part of, for example, the IPCI for the lithium batteries. Uh, not all the glitters is uh, gold and we use electrochemistry. This is a, a, a good thing for the optimization and the changing of the process, but it might be even one of the uh, problems of the process too, because uh, electrochemistry uses electricity. So uh, the question then is how is produced electricity? If you use renewables, then everything is okay. You don't have CO2, you don't have water uh, and so on. If you instead you have hydroelectric, you use the blue water. If you have fossils, then you produce the gray water. So depending on which, uh, on which country you, you build your plant, then you modify the water footprint of the same plant. So the water footprint is not only, not only a matter of the process, but even on where you build it and the choices that you make. Uh, pyro against the hydro, the case of lead. The case of lead practically is the same. You have uh, the galena, that is a sulfide of lead. You have a technology, a pyro technology, and you produce the metal. So because the lead is made by pyro, as the same steps of the zinc, mining, flotation, filtering, roasting, smelting, and refining. And so has the same drawbacks from the water point of view. 
you produce a lot of uh, gray water, you use blue water, and you use the green water. Uh, now, up to now, all the improvements for this kind of pyro technologies are made based on the same pyro process. So they don't choose to modify the process, by the but they optimize and they apply the three R rules to change the, to decrease the quantity of water used or the quality of water used. Uh, for the secondary, uh, as NGTech, we are able to give solutions. Uh, I will not talk about them uh, so longly, but I would like to uh, let you know that the possibility of the secondary lead goes through a crushing separation and recycling. This means that you obtained the, the uh, all the different species inside the material. Then you, with this kind of process, stopping here at recycling, then you will produce a few quantity of gray uh, water, you use a few, a few quantity of blue water, and then you use, use the green water. Then you have to choose, depending on your, cho on your choice, and now the choices are all around the world to go to pyro normally. Uh, if you go to pyro, then you have the same processes of the pyro from the primary. So the sulfurization, smelting and refining, and you have the same problems from the water point of view. If instead you make a different choice and you go to the hydro process, and we have a few examples, not only from NGTech, but even from other industries. So it's not only uh, a choice of NGTech, it's not a uh, uh, white fly. Uh, hydro, through the hydro processes, you use the electrochemical process, you use hydrometallurgy, our process is named FAST technology, and practically is the same as the, for the zinc. So you use a few quantity of the blue water and you produce the green water. The gray water is forgotten practically. Other processes from our industry. Uh, I simply give an array of, of the process. The lead has two processes. The zinc has one process. The, the copper, two processes, one from primary and one for the secondary, and the aluminum has other two processes. These are all hydrometallic, uh, hydrometallurgic metallurgical processes. So they have all the benefits of the process they already mentioned here, and they have the drawbacks of an hydrometallurgical process. So nothing is completely free from a, a full water footprint. If you want to do something, water footprint will always be higher than zero. The lithium, we go finally to the lithium. Uh, the lithium is a, a very, very, very big problem, even from the recycling point of view. Uh, from, for the water footprint, uh, there are only opinions. In my, in my opinion, there are opinions in literature. Only because, why? Because there's a big question mark in the lithium battery. Why? Because uh, you have around the world a very amount, a very big amount of types of uh, lithium batteries. You have a lithium metal and lithium ion. So still lithium metal is still present in the market. Then about the chemistry, you can have a nickel, cobalt, uh, manganese, iron phosphate, you can mix them in many ways and you have thousands of types of lithium batteries. Then you can change the, the type of electrolyte, liquid, gel, or solid, and you can change the chemistry of the type of electrolyte. So you can multiply again the number of lithium batteries around the world. And finally, but not the least one, you have thousands of shapes of lithium battery. A recycling plant must only not un, uh, take care of the chemistry inside the batteries, but even on the shapes, because the, the, the initial machinery, and you will see in the next slide, must take care of the shape, take the battery and destroy it in a, a smart way. So we don't know what is the water footprint because simply we don't have a one simple chemistry and one simple lithium battery. And things get even more complicated when you uh, go to the uh, processes that are suggested in literature, not the processes that are applied around the world because there, there is practically no process at the industrial scale around the world. There are few uh, prototype uh, processes. There are a lot of uh, chemical reactions written in literature but they are made only uh, in beakers inside the laboratories. So the suggestions uh, in the literature go through many ways, the crushing, dismantling, reusing, pyro, then they can apply pyro and chemical, they can use electrochemical, or they can make the opposite, use them first the chemical, then the pyro. They can make extraction before, after, uh, all, the, uh, all the possibilities before, and they can use the complex sums of complexation. Uh, 
so all these kind of, uh, of reactions are suggested in literature. But one key, one key point uh, common to all these processes is that they focalize only the, on the extraction of very few elements, cobalt, nickel, lithium, and partly manganese, because these are simply the elements that are more interesting from the economical point of view. And there's no talking about the water inside all these processes. And uh, uh, one last point that is very important, that all these literature studies, they are based on, the near, on a linear approach. This means they make the reaction in a beaker. They put inside all the reactions. They make the reactions, they divide what they can take out, and then they are left with salts coming from the reactants that must be thrown away. So this is a linear approach, and this, is, this cannot be uh, a way to approach this, to solve the problem in a circular economy uh, world. So NGTEC is uh, inside the IPCI2 and uh, has a few targets because IPCI2 is still not started again. So the aim of our company is to uh, apply the reduce reuse recycle uh, policy to start finding the reusable batteries. As I already said, reusing is the best choice if it's possible. Depends on the economics, it depends on many other factors, but reusable is the best choice. Then we go to crushing. We want to go to crushing, but not normal crushing. We will apply uh, special techniques and not, not found in literature up to now. And we want to uh, obtain solvents, plastics, metals, and lithium. Uh, even taking the solvent is a good thing because up to now, solvent is never, uh, is always forgotten inside all the processes. Uh, hydroelectrochemical process then after the crushing, and we want to manage all the elements. This is a choice, not an economical choice, because for example, iron, it's a very cheap element from the lithium battery point of view. So trying to use chemicals to obtain simply the iron is not uh, economical from the beginning. So uh, there will be a very big discussion about economics of recycling and how making how to make a recycling process economical. Uh, but this is not my uh, point now. From the water point of view, we want to apply the recycling way that we use for all our hydrometallurgical processes. So the water will never leave the plant uh, from liquid form. We will produce a modular plant. We have to make, a, we will use equilibrium based reaction. And this is the key point. We will don't want to make reactions with uh, a strong energy and uh, uh, going to directly to the end product. We want to make equilibrium so we don't need to take out all the elements at once. We can make it during all the cycles that we make uh, with our process. We will use internal loops, no linear branches as, as much as possible, because as I said, linear uh, philosophy is, the, is a losing um, philosophy. As uh, an NG tech, uh, as NG tech normally, uh, makes recycling in lead acid, ba lead acid batteries, we will apply our expertise in the mechanical part. We will apply hydrothermal technologies, zero liquid discharge policies, and industry 4.0 data collections and other key points for the, the industry 4.0. We will have the, to make the construction of a pilot plant, and we will make the engineering, engineering of the full-scale plant. Of course, we are not alone. Uh, we could not do it all by ourselves. And uh, the three main partners of uh, our project are Midac, NLX, and Little Match. And uh, we, will be, we will serve them uh, to try to get the best uh, of what we can. Uh, then conclusions, this is the last slide. I don't want to repeat what, uh, what I already said. I would like to give you a few points that maybe they are provocatory, but uh, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, so despite a huge, a huge amount of work done in literature, for the water footprint calculations, many problems still remain. For example, the access to reliable data, especially for water emissions. As I said, water is a point that is coming out in the, in the last few years. Before, no one, nobody didn't care really about water. Uh, in the metallurgical industry, this is particular, particularly, particularly true. Uh, there's a lack of control in in and out fluxes. And so you have contradictory data in the literature uh, for the full water footprint. Again, the metals worldwide production is still anchored to pyrometallurgy. Pyrometallurgy is a good way to you, 
for example, a few processes for lithium, they take the lithium batteries, they crush them, and they throw them inside the, inside the uh, smelter. But they take out only cobalt and very few other things. They for, even forget the lithium. This is not a way to making recycling, in our opinion. Uh, the water footprint is then phased, and it's correct, uh, by optimizing the 3R rhythm. This is if you want to make the pyro way. Uh, I, in my opinion too, and I underline in my opinion, I think that a braver, far-sighted view of the battery key metals production is today possible, not only for the lithium, but even for zinc, for cobalt, for cadmium, uh, cadmium, uh, and so on. And uh, the, for me, the hydrothermal electrochemical processes are ready for the technical, technological jump. But they, must, but only see, by simply, but the people must try to uh, trust the people and try to make a brave choice for the process. These processes will play a central role in the next future to close the loop of many industrial everyday products, in particular for the water recyclability. Uh, if you work with the hydrometer, you work with liquid water, so it is much easier to understand and to try to find the in and outs of your plant. Even only for this, this is a big improve. And finally, uh, I had to read a, a lot of literature to, pre to make the, this presentation. Uh, so I have to train myself uh, to try to understand the world of water footprint. And I think the Water Europe is a good uh, way of uh, trying to make this training. So for me, there's even a need for training, even for me, uh, to produce regulators and to make information about the water destiny. Uh, I finally finished my presentation. I would like to thank everyone for being here and that I would like to thank uh, Maria and Water Europe for giving me this opportunity. Waiting for your questions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Eduardo, for this uh, additional interesting presentation. I just give you uh, uh, one of the questions that we received from the chat line. How do you achieve uh, zero uh, SLD? just vaporizing or also by crystallization techniques? This is the question, the most technical questions that we, uh, okay. we received. Good, because I'm not a politician, so I'm a chemist, so I can, I can uh, answer the technical question, maybe. Uh, so I think this question, I can answer it. And normally our choice for our technique, for our plants uh, is to uh, choose the right reagent. Uh, normally, when you make an hydrothermal uh, treatment, you must you must put inside some reagents, it's like for example, I say sulfuric acid, uh, caustic soda, or whatever. They never come alone; they come with water. So, sulfuric acid, for example, it comes in very different concentrations. You have sulfuric acid almost pure, ninety six percent, so only five percent water you have uh, uh, the 50% or even the 14%, depending on what you want and what are the exits of the water in your plant. So if you put a lot of water from the reagents, then you have to take care of this water. So uh, my boss always says that if you put water inside, someone has to drink it. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, we use a crystallization and we use vaporization. Uh, vaporization implies that we use uh, under vacuum vaporization and uh, we produce vapor that can be thrown directly into the environment as vapor, so simply water, or we can condense it and reuse it inside the plant. Uh, I have an example for the plant of uh, zinc production in South Africa that we built uh, uh, three years ago. And uh, for example, this plant was always uh, in low in water. So simply by the scrubber, this means the system that takes care of the dust, you throw uh, water vapor inside the in the environment. So we had to put inside water, uh, despite our reagents uh, in the plant. So we didn't have to make a um, liquid water from our plant, we had to throw inside water. So we always balance between crystallization, uh, um, producing liquid water, vapor, and the vapor coming out for the cleaning on the, of the environment or of the vapors that you produce during the plant. 
Thank you. Uh, there is another question. I don't know if we have a bit of time to answer to this. Uh, uh, I can take the floor uh, regarding this question. The question is considering the unprecedented growth in the need for batteries, primary sources of metals will be required for a long time. What is the expected ratio of re recycling and primary sources? What does this mean for the water free footprint? Uh, I think, Marco, we can say, and also Eduardo, that uh, one of the um, most important issues uh, within the IPCI2 is uh, the attention to the recycling and also to the sustainability of uh, the electric vehicle bat uh, battery value chain. So you will get these answers in a quantified way within the outputs of this initiative and also through the updates by the VDE, VDI conferences and workshops, as well as the various companies, because really companies, especially the ones dedicated to the work stream recycling, are very much dedicated to the quantification of the water footprint and also the necessary um, innovation that we have to develop in order to guarantee sustainability and uh, uh, primary source uh, sufficient to feed uh, all the needs uh, of uh, the European Union uh, uh, electric vehicle uh, uh, batteries uh, uh, field. So really it's a challenge. I strongly believe in this initiative uh, and this is why we did want this workshop because it is very specialistic, but really water footprint uh, and sustainable uh, recovery of raw materials is uh, a huge issue and uh, Europe is ready to take the lead for this. Uh, maybe Marco, you can say something else regarding this point. You put it perfectly together, Maria. So uh, as I said, uh, I guess um, the recycling quotas are, are still not not there because, because we don't have so much lithium ion batteries currently on the market. So this will probably start in eight to 10 years where it gets significant uh, in, in terms of recycling and recycling quotas. Um, but um, if you think about the new battery regulative um, oh, the the new battery reg regulation from the European uh, from the European Commission, they already said that um, in future batteries, the recycling quota must be higher than 70%. Exactly. Um, some, some companies are striving for 90%, like, like Norfolk, and um, you probably heard of, of them. So they are striving for e even higher shares of recycling. And I think it's currently possible in, uh, in academia we are to, to recycle 95% of a whole battery. So um, that's, that's a big issue that we have to tackle. And as Maria said, we will do this in, in those IPSAs. And I'm pretty, in, um, I'm pretty excited about, about the outcomes in potentially four to five years. And then we can set up this, the scale up of this lithium ion battery um, yeah, recycling. Maria, you're still muted. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And there is another question. Are there any standards for recycling uh, from Peter Rubik? Uh, not yet, but this is another uh, prior target of the IPCI project. So uh, that's the aim of the IPCI, standardizing, validating different technologies but uh, with a very highly sustainable standards put uh, these uh, new outputs uh, as uh, uh, you know top leading technologies in the world uh, really uh, i think we don't have uh, any more time to answer your questions uh, uh, marco gave you all of the details about the vdi uh, vdi vde uh, platform as well as the Water Europe, uh, uh, always uh, very welcome to uh, develop initiatives to uh, to this. I thank you very much, Doyardo, as well from Engitech Technologies for really the content pool from the water perspective uh, uh, technical uh, issues. Uh, thank you very much. And also to Marco, I, I really liked uh, also uh, your uh, highlight on uh, the need for, uh, for the knowledge transfer. 
And I would add knowledge transfer between academy, academic knowledge, and also industrial knowledge, application research knowledge. That is our strength within a Europe, and we need to, uh, you know, uh, pragmatically bring it to the market. Uh, that was uh, our past, is our history, and this will be definitely our future within innovation, uh, and especially within systemic value chain, the system, um, you know, uh, system sectors. So thank you again. Uh, it was very nice to have you here. Uh, sorry for the initial problems with the connection and so on, uh, but uh, I think we could overcome them. Uh, and uh, uh, see you next time, uh, hopefully, uh, within the new uh, initiatives on this, uh, um, on this uh, argument. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank Great. you for an interesting session.